Tonight, we begin this new series of messages on assurance. <coughs> I see a great need for a, a ministry on assurance. I think our day encourages people to assume too much. And there's no place for assumption or presumption in Christ. Talking about assurance, we're, we're talking about something very weighty, about knowing whom you have believed. <clears throat> now we're living in a time when the, the heart has been left out of religion, Christian religion. When I say heart, I mean the central part of men, the thing that governs what they do and what they say and who they are, that part. And it's been left out largely and the, the mind has been accentuated too much. When I say heart, there's only two kinds of hearts that can be possessed and you only have one. That's what make this clear, first of all. You have two natures, you got one heart. The heart you had before you come in Christ was unacceptable. Amen. So God took it out. Yeah. I want to comment briefly on these two kinds of hearts. Because if we speak about assurance, there's only one heart that assurance can be found in. <clears throat> Let's view the first type of heart. It's described a number of ways in Scripture. It's called in Hebrews 3.12, an evil heart of unbelief. <laughs> Some description, an evil heart of unbelief, just will not believe what God says. God says, take the country, the evil heart of unbelief says I can't. Yeah. If the Lord says, mortify the deeds of the body, the evil heart says I, I can't. If the Lord says, be holy. The evil heart of unbelief says, I, I can't. And it has its reasons it presents, of course. Then the heart is unregenerate. The heart of the unregenerate is also called a stony heart or a heart of stone. It's twice mentioned in Ezekiel 11, 19 and 36, 26. And the Lord foretold a time, a stony heart's a hard heart. It can't can't penetrate it. The word of God, as sharp as it is, just doesn't make an impression on the stony heart. The Lord said, he prophesied through Ezekiel, I'm going to take out that stony heart. I want to give you a heart of flesh, one I can work with. I'm going to take out the stony heart, or a hard heart, would be another way of saying it. In this uh, unacceptable heart is also called a double heart in Psalm 12, 2. They speak vanity, every one of their neighbor with flattery and lips with a double heart. <laughs> it's interesting. See, I thought you just had one. Well, this is one heart, but this guy is split. It, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. And sometimes it's uh, eager and sometimes it's slothful. You can't depend on it. You never quite know what this heart's going to do. It may crucify Christ. It may be glad to eat his bread. It, it's just a double heart. It's, Dave's referred to this as a double-minded man, and he was said, don't let that man even think he's going to receive anything from God. Amen. Don't let him even think that. <laughs> You know, do you I suppose you have a double heart? Just something to ponder. This heart, uh, unacceptable heart, heart, it's also called a fat heart. It's Psalm 119, 70. Their heart is fat as grease. But I delight in thy law, which means this fat heart doesn't. 
fat as grease. It's just it's covered over with the non-productive type things. It doesn't contribute to spiritual health at all. It's a deterrent fat heart. It's also called a foolish heart. Romans 121 said their foolish heart was darkened. It's flighty. It's like a silly dove. It can't settle down. It just... You maybe have met people like... Well, I know you've met people like this. You, there's heart. Their heart is uh, foolish. They're just thinking ignorant things all the time. When they tell you what they're thinking about, you kind of shake your head. Yeah. Foolish heart. And Romans 2.5 refers to it as a hard and impenitent heart. It's not only is it like a rock, it won't change. Yeah. Not going to change. We, we encountered this. We've even encountered this even recently. A person who maybe had a certain view and it was an erroneous view, but they just wouldn't change. That's all. It's that they had a hard and impenitent heart. They thought too much of the wrong people, didn't think well enough of the right people, but they refused to change. It's a hard and impenitent heart. And Romans says they treasure up wrath. God's going to pour wrath on that kind of heart. So if a person doesn't want wrath, they've got to get rid of that kind of heart. And uh, Hebrews 3.10 refers to it as an erring heart. <laughs> they do err in their heart. See, people who err in their conduct first erred in their heart. Heart that errs or gets off the path or strays. There's a heart, uh, an erring heart is a heart that gets off the path. It easily is distracted. It's easily detracted. Pretty soon it's wandering. That's just an erring heart. And, of course, Stephen referred to the uncircumcised heart. That's a heart that the flesh hasn't been cut away from it. It's dominated by the Adamic of fallen nature. It, if it hears God walking in the garden, it runs and hides. And if it tries to make preparation for confronting God, it's always scanty and not adequate and... That's a uncircumcised. See, these are, now remember I said the heart's not accentuated. So when the heart's not accentuated, this kind of heart is kind of imperceptible. People don't think about that there are some people, they are not acceptable. Amen. Period. Yeah. See, well, God can save anybody, but God won't save anybody. Amen. This heart thing's got to be addressed. Amen. This control center, the heart is to man what a control center is to a operation or an engine is to a car. It's just what makes the thing go. Some people are motivated. Their heart is corrupt. They're not motivated by the right thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you may offer apologies for them, you know, and say, well, they don't, you know, maybe, but after all said and done, they're wayward because they got a bad heart. Yeah. That's what's wrong. Till they get a new heart, you may be patient with them, but we're not sure that God is. He hasn't left us this idea that he just tolerates people like this for a long period of time. He, he hasn't left us thinking this way. He's left us thinking, you got a heart that falls into this category, you better get rid of it and right away. Now, assurance has to do with a, the new heart, type 2. <laughs> Second kind of heart. So what kind of, how, how is that heart described? Well, it's described by Ezekiel 36, 26 as a new heart. And it's a, not, like a, not like a new pair of tennis shoes. It's a different kind of heart. New in the scripture means different kind of heart. This new heart will not degenerate back into the status of the old heart. See, it's a different, different kind of heart. Rather than deteriorating, it gets stronger, stronger, stronger. The only question is that you have to resolve is whether you have one of these or not. 
If you do, the scripture tells you what it what it does. This new heart. Paul called in 1 Timothy 1 5 a pure heart. A pure heart. And Jesus told us that blessed are the pure in heart. See the pure heart. It's not it doesn't have a lot of garbage in it, a lot of defilements. It's pure. Jesus referred to it as an honest and good heart. And incidentally, it is in that order. It's not good and honest. Sometimes people quote that as a good and honest. It's not good and honest. It's honest and good. First, honest. See, every sinner is dishonest. No matter what they say, no matter what they can, they're dishonest. They haven't viewed God's world and come up with the right conclusion. Amen. They haven't listened to their conscience that is given to every person with the law of God written upon it. They're fundamentally dishonest. It's not a matter that they just made mistakes, though. That's not it at all. They're dishonest. This new heart is a pure heart. It is a sing it's devoted to a single thing. It's not divided. This new heart is a circumcised heart. Jesus has performed the operation of circumcision upon it. It separated the flesh from it. So the, the flesh that covered up and when the other heart had been cut off from this, from this heart. You might think that a person could be a Christian just have a lot of fat encased around their heart. Spiritually speaking, but that's not the case. Jesus settles that. He cuts the flesh away. Because the sin is just, he's in the same body. See, he cuts it away so it can die. So the body of sin might be destroyed. That is so it can die. Because destruction of the flesh is by death. And death is by crucifixion. Death by design is a slow process. If you've ever been around someone who has physically died, I've been around quite a number of them. It's phenomenal how the how strong the human constitution is. You figure someone would have died a long time ago and they're still they're hanging out. The flesh is like that. It doesn't die easy, let me tell you. But this new heart it just won't, it just will have nothing at all to do with the flesh. Nothing at all to do with the flesh, the sinful nature. It's just it's a circumcised heart. And this new heart is a Psalm 51:10, David said, created me a clean heart. It's a clean heart. Been purified. In fact, Acts 15 says that God purified their heart by faith. So it's a clean heart. And it's an established heart. 1 Thessalonians 3:13. The Lord establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. So this is the kind of heart now we're talking about. We're talking about assurance. We're talking about this, this new heart. That's what we're talking about. We don't have any kind of assurance at all, at all, to offer people who have evil hearts or stony hearts or double hearts or fat hearts or foolish hearts or hard and impenitent hearts or erring hearts or uncircumcised hearts. We don't, we don't have any assurance to offer people like that. And we need to tell them, say, if you want assurance now, you have to, you have, to have a new heart Amen. for this to happen. Now, why, why address a subject like assurance? Well, isn't that more or less automatic? Once you're in Christ, don't you pretty much automatically have assurance? And you just know, you know, you know that you know, as some uh, people used to say a few years ago, I know that I know that I know, and I wondered if they just were stuttering or what. Yes, this isn't something like that, brethren. Assurance is something that has to be developed and cultured. If you have to learn how to swim, to be assured you can swim, you may be sure that in the spiritual realm it's even more critical than that. If you expect not to sink, you have to know. You have to be assured. Otherwise you will. You aren't if you're ever teaching your children to swim, you know, 
He used to tell us, and we did that with ours, that when they were young, they taught them to swim like six months, you know. They taught them how to swim. Actually, all it amounts to is you're not afraid of the water. If you know how to swim, really, it's pretty hard to, pretty hard to sink. You just wiggle around a little bit, and you stay in the top. But if you don't know, if you don't know, well, spiritual life is like that. I've told this, I think I've told this probably more than often than you want to hear it, but my first wife was an excellent Olympic-type swimmer in water up to here. She could swim with the best of them in water up to here. But as soon as the water is too deep, she sunk like a rock. Like she almost drowned in Lake Michigan. Lifeguard had to be dispatched to save her because she went out over a sandbar, got over her head, panicked, and she was drowning. What was, it, what was wrong? She didn't know she knew how to swim. <laughs> there are Christians like this, brethren. They don't have assurance and they're sinking because they don't know. They make big blunders because they don't have assurance. They're not confident. They're afraid to launch out. They're afraid to do something for God because they don't have assurance. That's why it's necessary to speak on these things. See, there is such a thing as uh, self-deception. This is very much of a reality. Let me give you three takes. You can deceive yourself into thinking you're in when you don't have any genuine evidence that you are. Now, I come from a background where people have been baptized. They pretty much figured they were in. We chided the, some other people because they taught once saved, always saved, but we practiced it. Our, all our churches practiced that doctrine. <laughs> They actually, they actually practiced it. They condemned it in their teaching, but they practiced the doctrine. Serious, serious matter. Self-deception. 1 Corinthians 3.18 Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So because a person has a, perhaps a lot of education, don't let them deceive themselves into thinking that gives them the advantage in the kingdom of God, because it doesn't. You may have this big long string of degrees. They may even be Bible college and seminary degrees. But don't think that that will minister confidence and assurance to the heart. It will not. Galatians 6.3, if any man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. There you are. That person probably thinks he has assurance. But when the truth of the matter is, he can't come into the presence of God. God doesn't hear him when he does come. God doesn't answer his prayers. God is not holding him up. But he thinks he's something. He, that's why we minister on the subject of assurance. We don't want anybody to be in that category. Again, John said in 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, see? So people say that sometimes because they haven't done some especially heinous sin, so they think they have no sin. They might say it this way, I'm as good as the next person, or at least I haven't done as self-deception. So to address self-deception, we speak about assurance because assurance is not a matter of self-diagnosis at all. Now let's look at the meaning of the word assurance for a moment. If we look at it etymologically, that is from the standpoint of language. If we look at just purely from a language standpoint, in the Hebrew, it means without care. Or care here means concern. Without undue concern. So your person is assured there's no question about the thing they're assured of. There's no question about it. They're not they they're not have debilitating care. Wondering if they're in or out sort of thing. In the Greek language it means entire confidence or conviction. 
He means this board may look rotten, but I happen to have inside information that there's a there's a strong foundation. There's a foundational plank under this thing, so I walk right across this. See, assurance has to do with that. That the person knows more than the average person knows. He knows what's what's underlying life. In the English language, assurance means a state of being assured as a security. In other words, safe. You're sure you're convinced that you're safe is the idea. Being certain in the mind as you think straight. I know this looks this way, but I happen to know, I got some inside information that this is not what it looks like. It, Stephen goes, yeah, it looks like I'm going to be stoned and that's going to be the end, but this is really not what it's like. It really, I'm going, I'm going to go up when I'm stoned yeah. <laughs> yeah. instead of down. Amen. Yeah, assurance, see. And then the English Dictionary throws in this little bracketed comment. The Puritans assurance of salvation. See, so they knew the writers of the dictionary today knows that this isn't what the modern church thinks. So it goes back to the Puritans. Now we're back into the 15, 1600s. They used to talk about the assurance of salvation, but the church at large doesn't speak about this today. So you talk about assurance. You're on like a foreign soil, see? People don't know what you're talking about. Confidence of mind or manner. It is in your thinking. In your thinking, you're sure about the thing in your thinking. And you live in such a way because you know this is the safe way to live, even though all the world saying that's, that's the foolish. They're saying like the, like the crowd said to, like the disciples said to Bartimaeus, don't shh. <laughs> Don't holler so loud, the master's got business today. Don't, don't be trying to deter him, see. But the person who has assurance, that Bartimaeus was assured. Yeah, and really all he'd heard about Jesus, he didn't, I suppose, have a lot of information about Jesus. But what he knew, he, he was assured of it. Amen. And so he called out for, for mercy. Amen. Now in Christ... <coughs> Assurance is the result of relating one's personal status and progress with divine affirmations. By divine affirmations, I mean scriptural statements. So that what assurance, the assurance I'm talking about is the kind that reads, they shall all then know me, or they shall all be pure, or they, they shall not lie, or they shall walk in my statutes. Any of those, they shalls, Assurance says, that's me. I recognize that's, I recognize that's me. That's the way I am. That's the kind of assurance we're talking about. Now let's look at, at a couple of statements made about assurance, made of assurance. Uh, here's, these are statements that an assured person made. Philippians 2.19 I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. Now, those are remarkable statements. He was away from the Philippians, yet he, he knew God was going to make a way for him to send Timothy there so Timothy could report on their status and come back and tell them about it. See, that's assurance. I trust in the Lord. Amen. I know this is going to happen. Now, there, you can't really put borders around this. It's, it's amazing how much of this is, uh, is in Scripture. And you've got to really be able to, to see it. I know. Oh, Timothy said, Paul said to Timothy, I know whom I believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. See, I know that's assurance. It didn't make any difference what other voices were saying. It didn't make any difference what other impulses he felt or temptations were pulling him down. It didn't make any difference. He knew this. And I'm going to affirm in this series that you can't really live for God if you don't, if you aren't assured. Uh-huh. Amen. You'll, you'll fail. Amen. 
Because this thing is set up, so you've, you've got, I understand when you first began, your novice God will make you stand to keep you from falling. He'll do this, but then there comes this time when by reason of time, you ought to be teachers. And if you've not matured to the point where you know, yeah. and that time comes, you'll fall just as sure as I'm standing here. You'll not be able to keep yourself by discipline. You may be able to keep yourself from like especially heinous sins and yeah. transgressions, yeah. but you will not be able to keep yourself from falling. That's going to be done through assurance, knowing who you have believed. Amen. One several times, Paul would say to write, people he's writing to, I have confidence in you touching the Lord. There's enough evidence in the people yeah. that he was persuaded they'd mature. Amen. He was assured of it. Now, it makes a difference. If you're assured the people are going to grow, you don't have to beat them up. You don't know. We, we enjoy kind of this environment. And it's, a, it's a wonderful environment to enjoy. That there is, no, there is no one of us who would say, I have arrived. <laughs> I have apprehended that for which I have been apprehended. Not a one of us would actually say that. We come still, still come far short of our own ambitions, let alone speaking about God's ambitions. But when you have confidence, you say, ah, I know that I know this thing's going to continue to advance. I I know. That's assurance. And to be an effective minister, you've got to be able to see this in the people. If you're not assured, it changes how you minister. And there's some people they don't give you any evidence of assurance. <laughs> they don't give you any evidence that they're in. So it's hard to minister to people like that. Very, very difficult. But when you see the evidence. The assured person can bank on God to bring this thing through. All he knows, he knows all I have to do is I just have to spread the table, keep the food on the table, Amen. keep the water of life flowing, keep making them aware of Christ's presence, keep, keep proclaiming the gospel, and I, they're going to come along. I know they're going to come along. See, that's assurance. And a person needs to have it. Amen. Now, these assurances... coincide with the Word of God. And I want to touch on this now, uh, now briefly. There's, a, there's an association with confidence. Assurance and confidence are like tied together. Words, we talked about this one time recently about the word and, when it says the and something, it's like a knot that ties two things together and they stay together. Now listen to some of these. Hebrews 3.14 We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Alright, that confidence is like a sister to assurance. When you come in, you come in with confidence. That's where you come in. You know your sins are forgiven. You know you're accepted with God. You know that you're welcome in God's presence. Even if that's all you know, you know that, you know that. Now the secret is to keep that confidence. That when trials come, you keep that confidence. When there's opportunity to advance in the faith, you keep that confidence and advance in the faith. Assurance is a is goes side side by side with confidence. Now you know is we're not talking about self confidence. We're not talking about that. In fact, Hebrews ten twenty five says, "Cast not away therefore your confidence." Well, throw it away, which has great recompense and rewards. You've come a long way now. All of you have come a long way now. But probably there will not be a week pass until some of you will say, "You know, I don't know." I haven't come as far as I should. I don't cast away your confidence. Mm -hmm. See, in your confidence and your assurance, that's what keeps you. 
And even if it's a flickering flame, do your best to keep it burning. Keep that confidence and assurance burning. And whatever causes that flame to reduce, identify it and get away from it. It's lethal not to have confidence. There's a certainty, there's a certainty involved in this uh, assurance. I know, it's frequently mentioned in Scripture, I know this, I know that. It's a certainty. I am certain that this will turn out to my salvation. See, I, it's, it's a, that's assurance. It's an aspect of assurance. Being certain is always disappointing uh, to me when I hear someone voice doubt. Even though I know that there's such a thing exists and your person shouldn't pretend they don't have doubt, if they do, they should pray help thou my unbelief, something like that, see? Because doubt, it doesn't have a great recompense or reward, <laughs> not doubt. Certainty. Then there's sureness. When something is sure, you, you know the outcome of the thing. You know how this is going to turn out. Remember David said, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, that's assurance. That's assurance talking. These are expressions of assurance. For Psalm 85, 9, surely his persuasion, his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. See, so surely, I have no doubt about this, if I fear the Lord his salvation's right there. If I don't fear the Lord, it's another matter. Now I'm defining what assurance is by the associations that are made with it. Certainty, confidence, sureness, persuasion. Now you probably talked to someone and they tried to convince you of something you said, I'm not, uh, you didn't persuade me on that. I'm not persuaded about that. And you never want to say that about the promises of God, the God that God has made to his people. You never want to say, I don't know if that's me or not. Persuasion is you're convinced what God said yeah. is true. And God has said a lot mm -hmm. about his people. And what he does with his people and where his people are going and what his people have and what his people are. He said a lot about it. Romans 4.21 says that Abraham was fully persuaded. <laughs> no, no question about it. That what God had promised, he's able also to perform. And he had an impotent man and a woman with a dead womb on his hand. So maybe there's something God has said to do, you don't think you can do it. Maybe you've read where God, where God requires a lot of you. Maybe you're tempted to think, oh, I don't know. That's just pretty ambitious. Maybe some of the other brothers and sisters can do that, but I don't know. You can be fully persuaded. That's what assurance does. It persuades you fully. What God has promised, he's able also to do. If God says, I can make you stand. You don't say, well, I, I hope that's true. Or maybe you've never been in a gale where, you, where standing was an issue. And you say, I don't know whether I can hold up under this or not. Then, you're, then assurance has got to kick in. It's got to say, no, I know God can make me stand. Right in this fierce spiritual gale, God can make me stand. That's what assurance does, see. Persuades you. I am persuaded, Paul said. I am persuaded of this, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a lot of... <laughs> It's a lot of things. I'm persuaded death can't set, death can't move God to quit loving me, can't through Christ. And life, what about life? Life can get pretty hard. If, are you persuaded that life can't separate? This is assurance. Now we're talking about assurance here. 
persuaded that this can't separate you from God. It may take all the things you have. It may leave you in a bitter state of health. It may lose all your friends. It's, your how all your possessions may be taken from you, your children taken from you, but that that doesn't mean you can't be assured. You can be persuaded these these things are bitter experiences that we don't wish them for anybody, but they can't separate us from the love of God. Even principalities, powers that are more more potent and capable than we are. They're like Goliath to David. You take God out of the scenario and David doesn't stand a chance. I put God in the scenario and nothing's able to separate David. Nor height. Some people have one great spiritual experience and then they forthwith die. They go up to the mountain, they see the promised land, and they just, oh, praise God, then they just wither. Oh, I've seen it happen. But height didn't do that. They didn't get too high. That isn't what happened. They had their head too close to the earth. Yeah. Paul said, um, I suffer, I'm suffering for the Lord. For it's because I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed because I'm not liked a lot. I'm not ashamed because I'm in prison and the ones that accuse me are roaming around free. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed that every other member in my family thinks I'm a nutcase. I mean, I'm not ashamed of this. I'm not ashamed. Because I know whom I believed. Amen. That's assurance talking, see. Amen. I know whom I believed. I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded. There it is again. I'm persuaded. He's able to keep. Now, in this case, it's not me. He's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Like, like a bank account. You're laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. where moth and rust doth not corrupt. And he'll keep it. Amen. I'm assured he'll keep it. It looks like it's gone. From an earth standpoint, it looks like it's gone. And, and from Earth's point of view, it looks like I'm a fool for making investments like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm persuaded. <laughs> He's able to keep what I've Amen. committed to him against that day. That's assurance Amen. talking. See, assurance talks Amen. like this. Here's, some, here's a statement of assurance of some previous saints. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded, there it is again, we're persuaded of them and embrace them and confess they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This is like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob we're talking about here. They were given the promised land and never got any of it themselves. Yet it was promised to them. But they are persuaded, we're going to get it. We're going to get the inheritance. It's going to come, just not yet. We're going to have it. We're going to have it. God's going to come through. I'm persuaded of this. So I'm just going to assume the posture of a stranger and a pilgrim. That's what I'm going to do. I'm a sojourner. See, that's assurance. Amen. That's talking. Yeah. Then an assurance <coughs> is associated with the witness of the conscience. And you do want to be in tune with your conscience. That's something that every man receives, a conscience, uh -huh. a kind of an intuition of right and wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very nebulous. It's not, it's not defined precisely as like the law, but you can know it's there. The witness of the conscience. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience... Also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That's assurance talk. That's just another way he has of saying assurance. The Holy Spirit, like whispers to his spirit, right? That's right. You're right on there. Well, that's, that's right. And your inner conscience is like, kind of like a peace. that You can't explain it to someone that doesn't have it. But then who wants to anyway? I'm interested in explaining it to someone who does. You sense this. this you sense this if things are going to be okay. Remember when uh, well, the Jeremy and family testified their experience going through the tornado, there come a point in that experience when they got assurance. 
Uh, you could you couldn't like market this or yeah. but they know what we're talking about here. Amen. And you can have this in any kind of trouble or circumstance, any kind of trouble or situation. You can have this assurance and confidence that fully persuades you, just fully persuades you. And nothing can deter you from it. And your conscience doesn't condemn you. See, Adam and Eve's conscience, con when, G when God came in the presence, their conscience condemned them. But when God appeared to Noah, his conscience didn't condemn him. Because <laughs> he is a man of faith. He walked with, in the fear of the Lord. Peter said this in 1 Peter 2.19. This is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief wrongfully. So yes, I was treated unjustly. There's a lot of reasons why this shouldn't have happened to me. But I'm, I'm going to have a good conscience about it. God's going to settle this account. Amen. Oh, this is a great peace and assurance Amen. to have this aspect of assurance. Not only assured that God's on your side, not only assured that nothing's going to separate from the love of God, not only assured you're accepted by God, but assured God's going to settle the accounts. See, God doesn't condone injustice. Make no mistake about this. When there's no justice in the land, it's marked down in the books of heaven. Yeah. And God made a frequent note of this in the prophets, that there was not justice in the land. Yeah, and we live in a time like that. Amen. When the innocent party is the one that's penalized. We've got incidents right now among us of unjust things that are happening, but the person can't resort to legal means because the law would side with the unjust person. But that's all going to be resolved. Amen. God's going to straighten us out. If not in this world, the world to come. Yeah. Paul said to, to the Philippians, I trust in the Lord that I shall also myself shall come shortly. I'm tr this is assurance. I'm not able to come now, but I have assurance I'm going to be able to come eventually, be able to be there with you. Now, these, all of these associations that assurance has, they're all statements from the Scripture. That's what I want you to notice. They're, none of them are like intuitive. They're all based on the something God said in Scripture. Associations with them. And I read you quite a number of these uh, things, such as having to do with persuasion and the <coughs> testimony of the conscience and so forth. Now, do you think of a... Some of the statements of this, of confidence and in the face of trouble. The psalmist said, Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. Well, we're living in a volatile world, brother. We're living in a volatile age, and you, maybe you have pondered this sometimes. What if, you know, and everything from storms to war and what a pestilence and what a... Uh -huh. This is where assurance has got to take over and stir the ship. You've got to rest in the Lord. How about this word from Isaiah? Thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning shall you be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. How about that? So confidence and assurance actually strengthens the fiber of your soul. It's not wishy-washy. It's, it's not yeah. just well-wishing and this sort of thing. Well, I'm always confident, Paul says. I'm confident. We're always confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. See, how about that? That's a statement of assurance. That's what that is. We have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. See, that's in your prayer. You do want to work on confidence. You have access to God with confidence. That's, that's, cool. that's part and parcel of salvation. Access to God with confidence. Which means this, this is an essentiality. And how far does this go? This matter of assurance and confidence. How necessary is it really? 
Hebrews 3, 6 says that Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence, that's where his household, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Do you see, well I know you do, this is a rhetorical question, but do you see why it's important to us who minister that you have a grasp of truth, that you, you're able to hold on to it Amen. tightly because without assurance you, you, you can't make it. The, the, the trip is too long and the adversaries are too potent to be unsure about your status. Amen. So if you're not sure, you've got to be honest about it. If you're not sure and you want to be sure, you just tell God I'm not sure and I want to be sure. You just spill it out. Amen. Just like that. Abraham, he looked for a city. That's assurance. Because he knew there was one. He looked for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. What about some of the saints? They, they looked and desired a better country. That is a heavenly. See, that was assurance. That's assurance stating itself. And it was based on what God promised. Assurance is based on what God promised. It isn't assured that you'll have your dream. Or assured that your will will be all answered. That's not what the assurance is about. It's the assurance of what God said. Yes will come to pass. <laughs> Jesus one time said to his disciples, oh, this will stretch your faith to believe this, but this is, this is the truth. If you have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to this fig tree, which he cursed, but also if ye shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now see that? That's a commitment. Yeah. Admittedly, it, it may look too big to believe, and so some people will tell you, well, that doesn't happen anymore. So that's an easy way to get. But Jesus said, my words shall never pass away. That, that's what he said now. So you say, well, I, I don't know if I can believe that or not. Well, you can believe that, but you'll have to fight the fight of faith to believe it. There's circumstances, there's blockages right now before some of you that if you have faith, you can speak them away. I'm telling you the truth. And there's like no extent. There's no limit to how far this goes. It's just, if you believe in your heart and don't doubt, it'll be done. And this faith is the substance of things hoped for. Some verses read the assurance of things hoped for. So this is this is what the, the right arm of faith is assurance. The left you might call it is hope. And that's what makes faith so so effective. We know it's assurance talking now. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. We, see we this is something we know this. We have to be reminded of it from time to time. I understand that. But this is assurance. We're talking about assurance. We know this isn't, this, this isn't everything. The thing I'm experiencing now, this isn't the totality of my life. This is just an introduction of my life here. And I, God has already told me that where I'm going, there'll be no more of this. Amen. Then he just specifies some of it, oh, pain and sorrow and death. And, he said, but we're going to, they're going to pass away. So it's just a matter of me enduring this. But see, you can't do it without assurance. If you don't have assurance, you can't pass through these things. They'll, they'll knock you down. You can't just intellectualize your way through them. In other words, you can't let anything separate you from what God has said, the commitments he's made to his people. If you're Abraham and you've been hoofing around for several years, you can't afford to forget that God promised you'd have a son. You've got to keep that in your mind all the time. Then pretty soon God will put it all together and he'll say, no, not gonna, it's not going to be a servant. No, it's not going to be a son through somebody, through Hagar. It's not going to be that. He'll clarify it. It's going to be through Sarah. See, but if he hadn't held on to that promise, well... It would have been something else. We know, this is assurance talking, we know if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, 
and it will be. We have, not we shall have, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Already there. The resurrection body. It's already there. We have it already. It's just, it's just a matter of having assurance till we get there. This is the confidence here. It's just assurance talking. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have the petitions we desired of him. Now, you don't want to let anyone ever talk you out of that. That's the truth. And what I'm saying in this uh, series of messages is that assurance is there to be had, but you have to invest your faith in it. You have to fight the good fight of faith and keep the faith and sub subject yourself to what God has promised. And if you do, assurance will begin to grow. It'll take the place of those thorns and thistles that grew in the old heart. See, it'll grow up, become a tree. You can eat fruit from it, and it will bless your soul. So faith makes one certain, it removes doubt, produces hope, and generates confidence. That's what faith does. And assurance encapsulates those qualities, puts it all together. It's necessary to have assurance to finish the race. Run the race with patience, that endurance is set before us. You can do it. Salvation has equipped you for it. And I urge you to do precisely that. Stay in the race now. Don't let your heart condemn you. Shape your life around the promises. Put everything else after that. Put everything else after that. And believe this in your heart. God will keep you from falling. God will rebuke the devourer for your sake. God will make you stand. God will keep you from falling. God will guide you and lead you, and he'll do it so it won't gently. He'll do this. You believe this in your heart and go on your way rejoicing. Amen. Brother Matthew has our exhortation tonight.